Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you to Heritage for this opportunity to, to speak to you all. Uh, my name is Lee Miller. I'm the Extension Turf Grass Pathologist at Purdue University. Um, I've had to explain my job to my mother. It means I'm a coroner for grass. So when grass, the legal kind, dies, I tell folks why and I tell them how to fix it. Um, my job today is to talk to you about uh, some of the more common diseases of both cool and warm season turf grasses. So I know that we have a very diverse audience um, from Ohio all the way down to Texas and Florida. So there's no way that within one hour I can talk about all the diseases that occur um, on turf grasses, but I'm try gonna try to give an overview, hopefully give you a couple hints for control, um, hopefully some hints for identification, and then hopefully some ideas of when you can identify what the problem is, uh, to, to get with an expert uh, to a diagnostic lab and to get your sample off. So I'll give some, some hints and tips about that at the end. So a lot of my job is actually being Sherlock Holmes. Um, so I am the, the diagnostician here at Purdue University along with uh, being a faculty member. So I get these questions quite a bit and I, I talk with homeowners and lawn care companies. I know there's a lot of lawn care operators on here. Um, as well as golf course superintendents and, and sports fields. Um, but I'm going to concentrate, hopefully, most of this on higher cut turf. Um, so we're not going to go to the real high amenity turf grasses uh, like golf course putting greens or, or even into uh, soccer fields and baseball fields and, and some of those higher, higher amenity turfs. Um, so this is from a homeowner. You know, why won't my sod establish? Um, obviously, they put some money into this and it's it's declining very rapidly. So one of the hints I want to give to you is when you're you're working with one of us, um, one of us diagnosticians is to kind of take a step back um, and, and kind of give us an idea. We, we want to see what the whole picture kind of looks like and what the uh, the symptoms look like across the whole lawn or across the whole uh, turf grass area. So I asked the homeowner to do this and. Uh, the fella got up on his on his roof, um, and I hope I'm glad he didn't fall because I'm not sure if I would have been liable. Um, but some of the things you can kind of see here are that there's a lot of shade, so that can contribute to disease activity. Um, here's another one which really got me uh, concerned because he's over top of his uh, flower pot there. Um, really didn't hope he fall he would fall here. Um, so what we're looking at here, and and I had to ask a couple questions because I couldn't really find. Uh, I could find a couple pathogens, but none of them that really correlated with these symptoms. So it was about the second or third time I was talking um, and, and phone calls back and forth. And I got his wife on the phone and he said before she said, before we put the tall fescue sod down in early June, which, by the way, is a bad time. I put down fertilizer and then my husband told me that he also put down fertilizer. So we calculated that before they put the sod down, they had somewhere in the neighborhood of four to five pounds of nitrogen down. Um, and basically just from the salt alone, they, they burnt their sod from, uh, from the bottom up. So when you get into these kind of situations, particularly if you're new onto a site, most of the time you're going to be working with a client that's having trouble with their, uh, their turf grass uh, issues. You're going to have to be a detective a little bit, kind of the same way that we are. Um, and asking these kind of questions is going to be very important. So I would lose my, my license as a turf grass pathologist if I did not show you the disease triangle. Um, so diseases occur, and actually you can call this the pest triangle. Um, all pests occur when we have this interaction of these three factors. So we have a susceptible host, we have a favorable environment, and we have a virulent or an aggressive pathogen that's present. So all three of those that are together uh, will cause uh, decline. And, and what I like about this particular triangle is that all of this is kind of on a sliding scale. So as I orient this presentation, I'm going to kind of go around these three factors um, and we're going to talk about the host. And when you're when I'm talking about these and I'm showing this graphic, think about what you can control. So with turf grasses, we can change what the turf grass is maybe to something that's a uh, little bit more resistant or not susceptible to a disease or to a certain pest. So we're going to start with some of the common mistakes I see just with turf grass selection. So this is a, another instance um, with a homeowner that I was working with. Um, my background, I've moved here at Purdue in 2022. 
I was at University of Missouri for 11 years um, doing a, a very similar. So Kirksville is Kirksville, Missouri. Um, so right off the bat, when you're reading this, you should see what some of the issues are. Um, bent grasses are for golf courses. Perennial ryegrass is very susceptible to the disease. They plant it again in May or June. So they're planting cool season grasses right before the hottest part of the year. They're basically putting babies out there and asking them to run a marathon. Um, so the, the real kicker here is it didn't show any signs of distress until six inches of rain. Um, and this is the bag of, of grass that I got or what used to be grass. Um, so there's not a lot that's in that bag that's going to make it. Um, I also will reiterate this at the end is when you do send a sample in, don't send it in a plastic bag because that basically will start all the decay. Um, but in this case, there wasn't a whole lot I could tell a homeowner to, to do other than uh, to go in and try to reseed something like tall fescue or Kentucky bluegrass um, because this, this obviously wasn't going to make it. And in this case, they really did. They put the truck in before the boat. Um, and that's, that's sometimes the situations that you're going to walk into. Another thing I want to talk about is, um, you know, we, most of what we recommend are either going to be tall fescue um, alone or in a uh, blend of different varieties or Kentucky bluegrass alone or in a blend of different varieties. But what we often see are also these tall fescue Kentucky bluegrass mixtures. Um, and they're normally in a ratio of 80% tall fescue, 20% Kentucky bluegrass, or 90-10, something like that. Um, so this is actually uh, my major professor, Lane Treadway, who you're going to be hearing from uh, later. Uh, but he did this study looking at these mixtures, and it becomes very apparent when you look at the pictures that there is a size difference here, that tall fescue is a much larger seed and Kentucky bluegrass is much smaller. And really, when you think about nature, Nature cares about how many seeds we put out. It doesn't care about the weight of those seeds, but it cares about how many plants you're going to be putting out. On top of that, Kentucky bluegrass is rhizominous, so it is going to spread one into separate daughter plants, whereas tall fescue is a bunch type grass. So when you actually put out a 90-10 volume mixture or weight mixture, it's really 50-50 as far as the number of seeds. So with that, it's important to realize that even with these, these mixtures of these two different species, Kentucky bluegrass can take over. Um, so this is the study done by Dr. Treadway. You can see the percentage tall fescue. Just when you start 90-10, right off the bat, that's when the seeding was done, you're really at 50-50 as far as the number of seed. And if you look at over time, just in three years, how much the Kentucky bluegrass actually takes over, because remember, Kentucky bluegrass is rhizominous, so it is going to spread into those open areas. Um, so if you're looking for tall fescue, it's really, and you want to have some of those characteristics, the more drought tolerance, um, some of the more disease tolerance, which obviously I'm gonna talk about, you really wanna start off with about 100% tall fescue when you're doing your seeding. So one of the, the, um, the good things about tall fescue versus Kentucky bluegrass is if you can identify the host Sometimes, and you can identify what the most important diseases are. So on tall fescue, by far what rules the roost is brown patch. Um, and on that side of the screen, you can see there's a very characteristic lesion. I'm gonna go into both of these diseases in more detail, but if you can identify the host as tall fescue, for the most part, you're probably going to be, if, particularly if it's a foliar disease, you're going to be looking at brown patch. Um, that really is kind of the Achilles heel of tall fescue. Whereas on the other side of the, the uh, screen there, if you identify Kentucky bluegrass um, and you see that lesion that goes all the way across, see how it, it's kind of, we call it an hourglass lesion, um, that's going to be dollar spot. Even, those, the, those, even though those stand symptoms look similar, you can see that there is a difference there in the lesion and also, if you can identify tall fescue as multiple ver uh, veins that run up the length of the leaf uh, blade versus tall fescue, which is folded, and you can kind of see that translucent, and then also has that infamous boat-shaped leaf tip, if you can figure out if it's Kentucky bluegrass or tall fescue, you can already kick the can down the road 
And you pretty much know that you probably either have brown patch or dollar spot if you have a disease issue. Also very important is knowing what and knowing what the host is, is the difference in the disease susceptibility. So I talked about brown patch versus dollar spot, but look at the large number of diseases that Kentucky bluegrass is susceptible to as opposed to tall fescue. And that's one of the reasons why we, we tend to, to shy towards tall fescue for some of these lawn situations. Tall fescue hosts um, what's known as an endophyte. So it's a symbiotic fungus that lives symbiotically along with uh, the grass, even from seed, and confers some of this disease tolerance, insect tolerance, and heat tolerance. And Kentucky bluegrass doesn't have that. Um, Kentucky bluegrass's um, advantage is that it spreads, so it's not a bunch type. And then tall fescue's advantage is that it has this endophyte. Um, so some of these diseases, and I'll talk about that in the next ses session, um, some of them are very different in their management. So it's important to understand Again, identifying the host is extremely important um, in whatever lawn you're dealing with or whatever area you're dealing with. Um, therefore, you can get to some of these issues and, and that'll lead you down towards identifying what disease you might have. So now we're going to shift around the triangle and get into the pathogen side. Um, and first, I want to talk a little bit about fungicides. Um, I think because there's kind of this misnomer that when we think about fungicides, we think of them like herbicides and herbicides kill plants. Um, you know, they, they take them out. We see them turn yellow. We see them die. Um, insecticides kill insects. So if we're after annual white grubs, we know that it's going to take those out. And then, you know, like, like Caddyshack, one of my favorite movies, you know, Carl Spackler is going after the rodent, takes out the golf course, right? So, um, but that's not really what fungicides are. Um, most of fungicides are a chemical that can destroy or just inhibit fungal growth. And in fact, most of them are not killing the pathogen. Um, so when we do lab work and we take these pathogens and we put them into Petri dishes and we put the fungicide into the media and put the pathogen on top, a lot of times what happens is it holds it for, for a certain amount of time and then that pathogen actually will start growing through the media. Um, so really, most of them are just arresting the fungal growth. And many of them actually are fungistats, so causing that static uh, or causing the metabolism to be static. And not many of them are true real fungicides um, and true toxins. And some of those implications are that fungicides are a temporary fix. Um, so the pathogen and the disease is going to be back. Now, when we go out, we put a pre-emergent herbicide down. A lot of times we're doing that one time a year, or, you know, if you're doing split applications one or once or twice, whereas fungicides need to be applied on a regular interval. So some of these are 14 days, 21 days, or 28 days. So once you start down a fungicide regimen, it's important to realize that it's not just going to be one shot and you're walking away. Um, because you're trying to control thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of individuals, and you're not able to do that, um, they're going to regrow and come back. Also, we do have to think about fungicide resistance. We have to think about that more in some pathogens than others. And I'll talk about what some of those are. So these are, I'm going to start with the cool season lawns and talk about some of the diseases that impact those. So for tall fescue, I already mentioned brown patch. Pythium blight is another one that's, that's very common. Uh, Kentucky bluegrass really shifts towards pythium blight and then dollar spot. And then Kentucky bluegrass gets a soil-borne disease um, called summer patch. Um, and summer patch is very, very difficult to control. Um, I'm not going to have the time to discuss that pathogen today, um, but that is one that, that does, once it's kind of in a turf grass area, it, it does take some, some integrated management, fungicides and, and also some fertility uh, aspects to try to get that one under control. Creeping bent grass, which is on golf courses, on golf course putting greens, it's cut to an inch of its life. You can see it's susceptible to a, a lot of different diseases there. And then perennial ryegrass is another one that sometimes we see in uh, some of our more northern states. Uh, and this one is, can be really susceptible to a number of diseases as well. So on cool season grasses, I'm really going to only have time to talk about three diseases. I'm going to talk about tall fescue, 
um, and brown patch and, and a disease that we're starting to see more and more of on tall fescue, which is gray leaf spot. And then on Kentucky bluegrass, I'm gonna talk about dollar spot and contrast that to those other two diseases. Brown patch, like I, I stated, is kind of the Achilles heel of tall fescue. Um, appears in hot, moist, overcast weather. I like to use this 6-8 flip-flop rule where it's at when high temperatures are at or above 86 and low temperatures are at or above 68 degrees, we know that we're in prime uh, brown patch weather. So we see it on almost all tall fescues. Um, we are getting some new resistant varieties. So keep your eyes out for that. And then Kentucky bluegrass, we actually can get it on some select cultivars. Um, one of the ones that I've seen it on very frequently is the new HGT Kentucky bluegrass cultivar. So it's not that brown patch can occur on Kentucky bluegrass, it's just a lot more rare than it is on tall fescue. On our high cut turf grasses, we're looking at light brown uh, patches from two feet up to, I've seen them up to 50 feet in diameter. And the grass is severely thinned. A lot of times it's not actually going to take the grass completely out, um, but it does really open up uh, the area for weed encroachment. And that's really where we start to see con some conversion. If you have that intersect between tall fescue and Bermuda grass um, and you get Bermuda grass contamination in, a lot of times that's because there is some brown patch that's working in that tall fescue. There's distinct lesions on the outer margins of the patches. I showed what some of those are, um, and I'll show a few more pictures. Um, it's, a, it's a tan interior with a dark brown margin. Um, so do yourself a favor and go out and, and get a, a magnifying glass or a loop. Um, and when you're out with your clients, use it. Um, that's one of my secrets. It's one of my secrets to kind of uh, at least appearing like I'm professional, I know what I'm doing. But you also can basically do a drive-by by the edges of one of these patches and look at these leaves and, and be able to identify what those brown patch lesions are and show them to your client. Um, that's that's a, a good way to build rapport. And then last but not least there, I want to put on the bottom, notice that I've got that crossed out where it's severe on highly fertilized lush turf grasses. There is some more recent uh, research that indicates that we should be kind of spoon feeding or providing some nutrition to tall fescue turf during the, during the summer. Um, that we shouldn't go in, in the spring and, and only put out a quarter pound or a half a pound and expect that to last all the way until September and October. Now, don't get me wrong, September and October is the time to fertilize cool season turf grasses, um, particularly uh, on, on older turf grasses. Um, that might have a nitrogen cycle built in, but it doesn't mean that it's the only time that we can do that. I would say also in caution that during the summer, you don't want to go out with urea and a full pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. But if you can go out with a quarter pound or a half pound, particularly if you notice that there is some nitrogen deficiency, uh, that will help with this disease probably more than harm. Um, again, you don't want to spark a ton of growth during the summer, but maybe a little bit if you're starting to see some deficiency symptoms. Brown patch diagnosis, as I said, I've kind of already alluded to this, that it's, it's uh, fairly easy to do. Identify what the host is. If it's tall fescue, you've got a pretty good clue that you've got brown patch on your hands. Uh, I know this is brown patch because this is my at least one of my, my old backyard. Um, and brown patch and shade go together very, very closely. Um, so if you look in the top left corner there, you can see that this is a shaded lawn, uh, particularly morning shade. Brown patch needs about nine hours of sustained leaf wetness. Um, and most of the time you're going to get a dew set. If there's shade in the morning, you're going to get that nine hours of leaf wetness built in. So again, this is what those lesions look like. You can see the dark brown, uh, it's kind of scalloped margin and then a light tan interior to that leaf blade. Also notice you can tell that this is tall fescue with all of those ridges or veins that run up the length of the, the leaf blade. And also tall fescue is normally a, a fatter leaf blade also, though some of the newer ones are gonna be somewhat thinner. Again, this is kind of what it looks like. It um, can kind of take a, a little bit of a wetter kind of look to it as well. 
Uh, Pythium and brown patch can kind of go together in a lot of uh, situations. So sometimes I can look at these lesions and see Pythium O spores as well as see Rhizoctonium mycelium. Um, it's very, everyone thinks that, oh, I've got this one disease. It means I don't have another disease or something else working. And that normally is not the case. Um, a lot of times, particularly in, on lawns that uh, don't have adequate maintenance or there's some other underlying abiotic problem, you know, I can find three, four, five different diseases uh, that can be active, active on a lawn. This is what I was talking about on Kentucky bluegrass, HGT on sports fields, um, and also golf course roughs. I'm seeing uh, a lot of brown patch that are that is occurring uh, on this particular cultivar. So if you do have HGT, be aware that you can have brown patch outbreaks. Now, part of the good thing about Kentucky bluegrass is it's very cosmetic. Um, it's very apparent, um, but Kentucky bluegrass can regrow back in fairly quickly. So it's not quite as severe as tall fescue, which again is that that bunch type grass. And once it goes, uh, once it gets kind of thin, it tends to to stay thin. So for brown patch control and and some of these control methods, you're going to notice have themes to them. Um, so uh, for most of them, the first couple points are going to be centered on environments and environmental manipulation. So reducing the duration of leaf wetness, increasing drainage, um, airifying to improve water inf infiltration and to remove thatch, all three of those are really all centered on water um, and trying to remove water out of the situation as much as possible. So when we talk about these diseases, we need a few things. We need temperature, we need water. Um, those are the two environmental components um, that we'll talk about again when we rotate that that triangle. And then we also need, need that host. And most of the time, if it's predisposed, there's something else wrong with it. It's going to get those diseases. Um, don't fertilize cool season turf grass too late in the spring. Um, that would be with those heavier rates. So remember, I kind of crossed that out earlier. Um, you can spoon free feed throughout the summer. You want to go out with a quarter of a pound during June or June, July, and August. That's fine. Um, but when I talk to homeowners, I normally pull back on that summer fertilization because a lot of times they don't know how to calibrate quite as well. And sometimes they'll put out too much or they won't put out a slow release fertilizer during those, those time periods. Fungicides are best applied preventatively. Um, so really we look a very strongly at the QOIs. Um, the DMIs are not working quite as well. And I'll show some of that, that data here in a minute. Um, so we look at azoxystrobin, pyraclostrobin, fluoxystrobin. So that's your heritage, your insignia, and your fame. Those are the ones that we kind of see have the, the longest lasting uh, brown patch control on tall fescue. And then we also have quite a bit of, of newer uh, granular formulations. So I've done some research with some of the, the granular formulations that have come out in the market uh, in the last five or 10 years. Um, there's been a, a number, a huge influx. They're really aimed at the lawn market um, because of these application advantages. You don't have to lug that water from door to door. Um, you basically can just have the bag there and spray it and spread it with your, your spreader. Um, you don't have to calibrate a sprayer. You don't have to worry about wind conditions. Um, and then you, again, you don't have to worry about that water tank door to door. And it, it really is a little bit more conspicuous. Um, so you can go out, you can apply your fertilizer and then go out and, and apply your granular fungicide formulation. We've done quite a, like I said, we've done quite a bit of testing um, and comparing the granulars to their sprayable counterparts. And for the most part, we see them working just as effectively. Um, so, you know, here in this case, we've got Pillar G that's working just as effectively as Insignia and Trinity. We've got Headway G that's working just as effectively as Headway and a tank mix of Heritage and Banner. And then we've got Heritage G and Heritage TL um, that are put together. And the other thing I wanna point out here is particularly in this study, we, um, we used the rate that was in the granular and we applied that in the sprayable rate. So it was the exact same rate that we were putting out um, for both of these as far as the amount of active ingredient uh, that we had in the tank as opposed to the, the spreader. 
So a couple of years ago when I was at University of Missouri, um, I, I had these disease reports that I was putting out and I, I started getting a readership and I started asking some survey questions just to get a better idea of what was going out in, uh, in the environment and what was going on out in, out in the field. Um, so I asked this question, approximately what percentage of lawns do you apply fungicides to? And I was kind of shocked at the response. Notice that none of them said 26 to 50 percent. And, and most of these respondents are lawn care operators. Um, so this is is really targeting the professional segment and, and not the homeowner segment. So what was really shocking is only about 11 percent said that, you know, in 10 to 25 percent of their or 11 to 25 percent of the lawns that they maintain, they're putting fungicides out. And that probably is because the homeowners just doesn't want to pay for it when they're when they're presented with it, um, you know, and, and almost more than half of them said that they don't apply any fungicides at all to the lawns uh, that they care for. So we I started that started to kind of get the, the gears going a little bit. Um, and there was a study, uh, you know, and the other thing I should say is that homeowners often call me and they say, OK, you've diagnosed brown patch. What do I do now? Um, you know, can I go out and I, I see this fungicide that's in uh, the, the hardware store and should I pick that up or at uh, my local farm store? And this was a study that was done by Damon Smith and, and Nathan Walker. This was Damon when he was Dr. Smith when he was at uh, Oklahoma State before he went up to University of Wisconsin and went back into farm crops. Um, but what I always want to do is, you know, particularly when you see um, one of us nerds, I mean, one of us scientists give you one of these graphs, always look for the non-treated control. And what you want to do is point that out first. And those letters that are at the end of the non-treated control, those are basically, if it's an A in this case, that means that whatever's been applied is no different than the non-treated control. And what I want to point out there is how many A's there are. Um, so all of those that are in the red there were applied either preventatively or curatively on 14 or 28 day intervals. And notice that they're not controlling the disease because they're not statistically different than the non-treated control. Almost all of those are thiophanate methyl or they are a DMI fungicide, either microbutanol or propiconazole. Whereas the ones that are working, and I talked about this earlier, are the QOI fungicides, also termed the strobulurins. And notice there that Heritage is working very well. Um, and Heritage is really a product that's targeted towards the professionals. Um, so what you would get a hold of. So when I would get a homeowner that would ask, Dr. Miller, what can I do for my brown patch problem? Um, for the most part, I would say, you need to have a licensed professional come out and apply heritage, uh, heritage G or Zoxystrobin or Strobulurin to take care of that issue. Now, I will say that Scott's has released a product, Scott's Disease EX, um, that does have a Zoxystrobin in it that is a, kind of along with this. So a homeowner can get bags of that. But for the most part, I steer them that way. Um, and I'm a doubting Thomas because I am a scientist and I'm a skeptic. So I did this myself. We got a couple over the counter and we compared them to three of the more commercial products. And lo and behold, we saw the same thing. So all of those that uh, basically have the hash marks there are the ones that we got over the counter at our local hardware store. So the Bear Advance and the Scott's Lawn Fungus Control. And you can see there that they are statistically not different than the red bar there, the untreated, whereas Pillar G, Heritage G, and Headway G control the disease better than, than the non-treated plots. So some of the conclusions there that homeowners should probably be looking at IPM principles um, as well as lawn care operators, um, particularly if a homeowner is not going to let you apply fungicides. Um, we need to probably think about reseeding brown patch damaged areas a little bit more. Um, so there are some more resistant cultivars that are starting to be released. Um, they're not completely resistant. And what I mean by that is it, it doesn't mean that they're not going to get brown patch, but they are going to get brown patch less than some of the uh, other, particularly the older varieties 
that the homeowner probably has in their lawns. And then last but not least, if a fungicide program is desired, um, a homeowner normally should utilize a certified lawn applicator. Um, and a zoxystrobin or pyroclostrobin or one of those strobulurin fungicides uh, tend to work the best for brown patch on tall fescue. So I'm going to shift gears and move away from brown patch and talk about a disease that we're seeing somewhat more, particularly when I was in Missouri. Uh, I've seen it a little bit here in Indiana, but not quite as much. Um, but particularly when we get into the transition zone, particularly on uh, susceptible cultivars of, of tall fescue, we are seeing some gray leaf spot infections that are concerning. So this one appears in late summer. So normally we've gone through, we start getting our brown patch somewhere in April or May, most of the time, May, June, and July, brown patch kind of chugs along. And then great leaf spots, some kind can take the baton here and we don't really recognize that it's a different disease. So very, uh, um, particularly tall fescue is somewhat susceptible and perennial ryegrass, particularly some of the older susceptible varieties, it will take perennial ryegrass out. Um, we also can see this disease on crabgrass, which normally doesn't make anybody cry, um, but that can be one of the kind of the, uh, the host plants that this can hop around on. One of the problems with gray leaf spot is that it's very rapid in its disease development because it proliferates by spores. Um, so it can be spread by mowers very quickly. It can move from plant to plant very quickly. Whereas rhizoctonia and dollar spot, they're mostly mycelium and they just don't move around very much. You know, they can kind of be a patch and they, they just, they don't, they don't occur quite as, as quickly during the season as gray leaf spot can. The leaves have very distinct spots with dark margins and gray interiors, and then the effective leaves will bunny whip, and I'll show a picture of that here in a minute. Um, this one is severe on over-fertilized turf grasses and then also on seedlings. So if you go out and you try to seed an area too early, um, if you seed it, say, in the beginning of August as opposed to uh, to uh, early September or mid-September, sometimes this disease can be an issue. So this is what it looks like. This is a, a tall fescue uh, research area that we have. Notice that it's not quite as organized in the patches. It's, it's kind of uh, splotchy here and there. And then this is, again, one where you're going to want to pick up your hand lens or even better, use a diagnostic lab um, and try to identify. Notice that um, we're not very uh, creative as, as scientists and pathologists. Notice that the, the spots look kind of gray, hence the name, gray leaf spot. But then also you can kind of get that buggy whipping symptom where the, the top of the plant kind of will curl down on itself where, when it blights. And then this is kind of a closer look at what that gray leaf spot looks like um, and some of the differences that, that you'll see between that uh, this kind of symptom and something like brown patch. And then this is what the spores look like. And this is where the real issue becomes is when you start to get these spores to proliferate, um, they can occur very quickly and move from plant to plant. So when it comes to gray leaf spot management, again, notice the first couples, uh, reduce the duration of leaf wetness, now that number two point there, don't use perennial ryegrass, that probably won't be there very long um, because there are some considerable breeding efforts uh, for resistance to this disease. So we actually might see more and more perennial ryegrass being used um, for uh, in some of these areas that we normally wouldn't because gray leaf spot has, has been taking them out. Uh, don't fertilize during the summer, particularly late. Um, and I should say don't over fertilize. Um, try not to seed tall fescue too early in the fall because those seedlings can be, um, or I should say too late in the spring. Um, if infection occurs, try to limit mowing and traffic if possible. Again, you can spread those spores around. And then most of the time, if you do have an outbreak, fungicide use might be necessary to curtail this disease. And one of the issues with this is that the strobulurins alone don't work well for gray leaf spot. It's going to be a shift towards thyrophanate methyl, which is something that doesn't work well on brown patch. So we've gone from we're using the strobulurins and then all of a sudden, wait a minute, why isn't my strobulurin working anymore? Um, so that's when thiophanate methyl, 
which doesn't work for brown patch, uh, is the fungicide of choice for use on gray leaf spot. And there is some concern for fungicide resistance. We do know that there is some strobularin resistance out there. Um, so it's important that we try to, uh, to manage this correctly and use fungicide resistance uh, management procedures. So I kind of have this timeline for managing tall fescue, uh, particularly for diseases. If we're gonna go preventative and we're gonna get on a, on a fungicide program, your strobilurins are gonna be somewhere around in late May. We can even wait until the first couple symptoms that we see so we can kind of look around and see if we can start seeing those lesions. Um, heritage and insignia are, are good uh, choices there. Uh, fame is another one. We'll continue that into late June and July. We might need two or three of those applications to kind of go through. Now, I also will say that Heritage and Signia also are fairly good preventatives for Pythium as well. So you can kind of get that extra kind of hit uh, with those two, uh, with those kind of products. And then later on, if gray leaf spot has been diagnosed, that's when we want to move towards thiophenate methyl and strobilurin. And then when we get into September, we think about overseeding. Um, so this is kind of my tall fescue timeline if we're going to think about going after it with, with fungicides and being preventive. Okay, now we're going to get away from tall fescue and we're going to move towards Kentucky bluegrass. Um, and when we think about Kentucky bluegrass, again, we're shifting our disease focus. We're shifting away from brown patch and away from gray leaf spot. Both of those diseases do not occur on Kentucky bluegrass, and we're going to move to dollar spot. Um, dollar spot occurs in a, uh, a wider breadth of temperatures than brown patch or gray leaf spot do. So dollar spot can start occurring in, in April or May and then last all the way until October. Um, for the most part, we think of this on Kentucky bluegrass, but also perennial ryegrass. Actually, it's the most ubiquitous disease that we have and infects the largest number of hosts. Now, the one turf grass species that I have not seen dollar spot on is tall fescue. Um, so, but everything else, you can see it on Bermuda grass, you can see it on zoysia grass, um, you can see it on uh, bent grass, obviously on golf courses. The difference here is that the leaves are bleached white. Um, so you're gonna see a real distinct white lesion. And then particularly on Kentucky bluegrass and higher cut grasses, you're going to see that hourglass shaped lesion. And again, this is another reason why you should have a magnifying glass or a loop. You can scoop this up and, and almost uh, you can uh, go get towards identifying this disease yourself. Now that last point there makes it completely different from everything else that we've talked about. So this disease can be severe on under fertilized turf grasses and actually can be an indication that we need some nitrogen to be applied because in some cases, Actually, I would say in, in most cases, we can grow ourselves out of this disease. So for dollar spot control, you've seen these before. All of those should look very, very similar. Notice the similarities between brown patch and, uh, and gray leaf spot and dollar spot, all of these diseases together. This one is a little bit different. So fertilize in the fall, spring, you might be a little bit careful, um, but you want to, this is one that you want to, um, you want to say, okay, we've got dollar spot. That means we probably need to put some nitrogen down. If we are going to go with fungicides, they're best applied preventatively or at the very first sign of disease. This is the one that it doesn't reproduce by spores, but can occur very quickly. Um, so a lot of the DMIs work well for this, uh, the benzimidazoles. Make sure that if you are in a residential situation that you're checking the label and making sure that it's labeled for that site use. And this is one where fungicide resistance is a concern. Um, so you do want to, particularly if you're applying a, a lot of fungicides targeting this disease, you want to make sure that you're in a, a rotation program. So the common thread here is that leaf moisture. Um, so all of these are foliar diseases. So the more that we can try and reduce that duration of leaf wetness. So I talked about brown patch needing nine hours of leaf wetness duration. Dollar spot or Pythium needs about uh, 12 to 13 hours of leaf wetness duration in a 24 hour period. Um, dollar spot is one that particularly at golf courses will, uh, they'll pull hoses across fairways 
to try and knock that dew off so that they can disrupt that disease cycle. Um, so think about the environment. And a, in a lot of cases, fungicides aren't necessary if we can do a better job at, re, at reducing this leaf wetness duration, particularly in irrigated lawns. So a lot of these disease problems I tend to see in irrigated lawns because they're most, most of the time they're being over irrigated. All right, so I talked all about uh, the, the cool seasons. Now we're gonna shift gears and we're gonna go down to Texas where it's only been 100 or 105, it seems like for the last, uh, the last year and a half, right? So there obviously we're gonna be using more warm season turf grasses. We're gonna talk about two different diseases, large patch, which occurs on centipede grass and zoysia grass regularly, and then spring dead spot, which regularly occurs on Bermuda grass lawns or Bermuda grass areas. So we'll start with large patch. Um, I kind of make the quip that this is the, the non-kissing cousin of brown patch. Actually, the pathogens are very much related. Um, they're both uh, Rhizoctonia solanis, but, and the reason I call them non-kissing cousins is that one of the ways that we separate these groups um, because we don't have some of the structures we need to identify them is we put them on slides and we put them together and we see if they fuse. Um, so that's the kissing part. So the large patch pathogen does not kiss the brown patch pathogen. Um, this also is one that is, I call it the artist formerly known as zoysia patch. Everyone wants to call this zoysia patch, but the real disease name is large patch. And the reason for that is we can get large patch on Bermuda grasses. We can get it on centipede grass. We can get it on other turf grass varieties. Um, so just calling it zoysia patches is, is not correct. This one, now I talked about all these other diseases that normally occur during the summer. Um, this one occurs during the fall or the spring when zoysia grass is either going into dormancy or coming out of dormancy. Now, in my experience from Missouri and also from Indiana, most of the time when it comes out of dormancy in the spring is when we get most of that. We see the really brilliant patches that will come out um, and we'll see some firing symptoms. Um, those firing symptoms will have very orange margins when the disease is active. These patches can, as the name implies, can be large. Um, very much I've seen them upwards of 50, 100 feet in diameter. Um, I used to be able to see them from outer space. So when I was looking for research sites, I could be able to go on Google Earth and actually look down at specific golf courses and say, hey, I see that you've got some large patch on number 12. Do you mind if I come out and do some trials on it? Um, so this is one that's, uh, can be very, very devastating to in a home lawn situation, also on uh, particularly zoysia grass fairways on golf courses. We see this disease quite a bit. So this is a, an example of what it would look like. You can see a very concentric, you know, almost I would, as being a pathologist, I would say this is a very pretty picture, um, but obviously the homeowner isn't very enthused. One of the other aspects behind zoysia a uh, large patch on zoysia grass, you got to realize that the homeowner has devoted some money um, into putting zoysia grass in because most zoysia grass is vegetatively propagated. So they probably have had it sodded or maybe sprigged in or they've done plugs. They put a lot of investment into this. So when they see large patch come in, it's, it's normally very devastating. One of the aspects with large patch is that it, it goes can go along with water patterns. So particularly drainage is a, a large aspect with large patch. So drainage and shade, when you have both of those aspects, a lot of leaf wetness and also soil moisture, we can get fairly severe large patch symptoms. And one of the aspects with large patch is that it actually doesn't occur so much on the foliage at the top of the foliage, but happens very can happen farther down on the leaf blade. Um, so here you can see that it's impacting on the sheath um, and that, that can become a problem um, when we're thinking about our fungicides and how we put them on. Um, so that's, that's something to, to keep in mind. We got pretty good at inoculating this disease, so we could, we could get it fairly regularly in our plots. So we've done quite a bit of fungicide trials um, with, uh, with this particular pathosystem. And here you can see how quickly it can, it can go from being small 
uh, to very big. And you can see the firing symptoms and my dog wincing there because uh, it's burning its paws. So with large patch control, you've seen the first three before. This one is very, very closely tied to drainage though. So particularly if there's irrigation and the, if you're working with a homeowner and they're irrigating their zoysia grass lawn in the spring, you might want to tell them to back off on that because they can really uh, predispose that lawn to this disease. Um, this is one where you want to be a little careful with fertilization too early in the spring or too late in the fall. But this is one that is not tied to nitrogen as closely as we thought, much like brown patch is not. Um, so you can fertilize in the spring when you start seeing some green tissue. You know, particularly, you probably haven't fertilized that zoysia grass lawn since the last summer. So you haven't fertilized it since August. Um, you know, that nitrogen that's in that system is gone. So actually, you'll see less large patch and get more recovery if when you go ahead and you're starting to mow that grass in the spring, go ahead and fertilize it. Um, we've done a number of different studies, as well as our colleagues at Kansas State. Uh, Dr. Megan Keneally, that just show that nitrogen in the spring is not tied to enhanced large patch pressure. Uh, fungicides are best applied preventatively, particularly some of those that um, in the fall or early spring. So the QOIs, again, Heritage Headway Pillar are, are labeled for residential. Many more are available in the, in the, tur in the lawn, or excuse me, in the golf market than are on the residential lawn market, but these are three that, that are, are commonly used. And one of the aspects, particularly in residential, is you might only get one shot at it. Um, so when, when do you want to apply that, that particular fungicide application? So on golf courses, sometimes they'll make two, even three applications. They'll make two applications in the fall and then follow it up with one more in the spring. Now, in a residential situation, you might only get that one fungicide application that you can budget in. The best time to do that actually is gonna be early in the spring and perhaps even before uh, you really start regularly mowing that zoysia grass lawn. Um, so we've shown this a couple years. This is an example of one, but you notice that we went out in April and those soil temperatures are pretty low. So 50 degree average soil temperatures at two inches, 50 to 55 degrees, you can apply that fungicide down and, and get good large patch control. And in this case, uh, Keritage would be the one that would be in residential. I also wanna point out that not everything that you see that damages zoysia grass is going to be a disease. So you also need to look out for chinch bugs. Um, we saw these quite regularly, particularly in my time in Missouri, and then also bill bugs. So don't always think that it's just going to be large patch. And, I kind of showed this, uh, the disease timeline for tall fescue, but this is kind of a pest timeline for zoysia. So you'll see these diseases are, are large patch that will occur in the spring and then also in the fall, but you most of the time will get recovery during the middle of the season. So when you get into June, July, and August, and you get that heat, that normally is when you're gonna see recovery. However, with something like chinch bugs, you're gonna get symptoms during the heat of the season, and the same thing with hunting bill bugs. Um, so keep that in mind. If you're trying to identify this disease um, or trying to get a handle on what's going on with zoysia grass that's declining, if it's declining in June, July, and August, and it's still declining through that period, you probably need to look more at the insect side than at the disease side. All right, so we've talked all about foliar pathogens. Um, so brown patch, gray leaf spot, dollar spot, pythium, all on the cool season grasses. We talked about large patch, which is a foliar disease on zoysia grass. Let's go down to the soil worn pathogen. And this is when things get really difficult. Uh, these diseases are ninjas. Uh, they basically will be uh, feeding and infecting on the root system. And you'll just be above ground thinking everything's fine. And then the, the plant will completely collapse. And the problem with that is it's very difficult to control these diseases because they hit below the belt. So spring dead spot on Bermuda grass is ex extremely severe disease. Uh, probably the major limiting factor to Bermuda grass use in the transition zone or anywhere that Bermuda grass goes into any kind of dormancy. The pathogen infects the root tissue in the fall and actually 
It's been shown it, it infects throughout the season and then really limits the plant's ability to overwinter. Um, so the, the pathogen can actually be in the plant for a while, start to really infect during the fall. Again, when the Bermuda grass is going into dormancy, limits the plant's ability to accumulate those carbohydrates. Then the next spring, as the name implies, the spring dead spot affected areas don't green up and everything else greens up around it. Uh, the patches can grow three feet in diameter or more, and if left untreated, they can keep recurring in following years. Um, so extremely important disease when, when we're talking about Bermuda grass lawns, sports fields, uh, golf courses. This is one that is pretty ubiquitous anywhere you, uh, Bermuda grasses are grown. Um, so when I first started in Missouri in 2010, I was blessed, and I, I'm a pathologist. I'm the only one that can say I'm blessed with this kind of plot but this is the plot that I was graced with. Um, so we did some studies looking at fertility impacts on this um, and, and found that uh, sulfur was, was a little bit more impactful than ammonium sulfate or calcium nitrate. Although those are shifts that you might need to think about um, if you have this particular problem. Here's another uh, example of what these patches kind of look like. And then you can see it, it not only impacts the the roots, but also goes up into the rhizomes, into the stolons, black and brittle, um, black and brittle rhizomes and stolons. So for management, fungicides are most often used. Um, Kabuto and Vallista have worked well in our studies and are registered for residential use. One of the issues with this is that these fungicides need to be applied in the fall. So you're not seeing any symptoms where when you're actually applying the fungicides. And that's a different mindset that we have to have with most of our soilborne diseases than we have with our foliar diseases. So we're actually applying when the infection period is, not when we're seeing the symptoms. So we normally think of soil temperatures dropping to 70 degrees is that time for applying these fungicides. Um, two applications are recommended at you make the first one when the soil temperature drops to 70 degrees. We're somewhat in that window now in, in Indiana, particularly in southern Indiana and in parts of Ohio if you're managing Bermuda grass. Um, and then you make another one 21 to 28 days later. One of the issues here is that this being a soil borne pathogen, it's not as easy to get that fungicide to the target zone. So it's not on the foliage. You can't just apply it to the foliage and expect it to get down to the roots and where it needs to be uh, controlling the fungus and the pathogen. There is some research that indicates ammonium sulfate can help control spring dead spot of one species, that's Herpotrica. That's mainly seen here in the Midwest, while another, uh, the other uh, can be controlled and that should say calcium nitrate for uh, Ophiosferella cori. So here in this region where most of most of the states are for this particular seminar, we would be thinking about shifting to ammonium sulfate and in particular trying to figure out which species we might have. This is some of the work we did with Vallista. Um, Rubigan used to be the, the standard. You can see Vallista here is working uh, just as well as Rubigan uh, was, and this was back in 2012. Kabuto has very similar uh, results uh, to, to the Vallista and the trials that we've seen. So now that we've talked about soilborne diseases, and I, I kind of alluded to this, um, particularly for soilborne diseases, we need to think about our application strategy. So when we look at a label, something like, say, Banner Max, we can look and it says, wow, look at all the diseases it controls, dollar spot, brown patch, powdery mildew, red thread, pink patch, and then we get down to summer patch and spring dead spot. Both of those are soil borne pathogens and you have to be able to deliver the fungicide to the root zone, um, which is a lot more difficult than what you would think. And if you don't do that, you basically are gonna be playing whack-a-mole uh, like this gentleman here is here. And I will tell you that these pathogens do not stick their head up uh, like, the, like this uh, game machine does. What also works against us, and this is one of my favorite uh, resources. So this is from the Chemical Control of Turf Grass Diseases. Um, and this is a, a table that shows all the different fungicides and all the frac codes 
and really has a, a ton of really good information just within this one table. But you can download this for free. And actually, Bruce Clark uh, is a co-author on this now, as well as Paul Koch. Um, so it's a very invaluable resource. And again, just type into Google chemical control of turf grass diseases. Um, and it's, it's a very useful uh, resource to have. But one of my favorite columns here is the one that says mobility. So C stands for contact, which means that it's just going to stay on the leaf surface. PMS stands for flow mobile systemic, and those are our only true systemics. In other words, they move up and down in the plant. Um, so notice there's only two of those, and I will say that those two are very limited in the diseases that they control. However, look at all of the other systemics that we apply. That means that they are xylem mobile systemic, which means that they move in the xylem or the water stream. Water stream only moves up in the plant. So what that means is as far down as you put the fungicide is as far down as it's going to go because it's going to be taken up by the plant and move up. I also will tell you that these fungicides tie up very, very quickly to organic matter. And there is nothing in our soil, particularly our thatch layer, other than organic matter. Um, so you have this kind of double whammy. You've got the fungicide that's taken up by the, by the plant and moves up. And you've got it tying up to the, the thatch and organic matter and not being able to get, to get down very deep into the root zone. So when we apply these fungicides, it's important that we have post-application irrigation. And I will tell you that it is a much taller glass of water than you think. So particularly on some of these fungicide labels, you might see, well, you can apply it uh, with post-application irrigation with an eighth of an inch of water or you can apply it in five gallons per thousand of water carrier volume. I'm here to tell you that an eighth of an inch of water, which is, if you look at it, it's 27,500 and change gallons over an acre inch, an eighth of an inch is 78 gallons per thousand square feet. Um, and this is what you're really going to need to push it down into the root zone. Um, and it, actually, I would prefer that you go up to two tenths or even a quarter inch, if at all possible. So that kind of limits your ability, particularly in a residential situation, if you're applying after, for a soil-borne disease and you've got to water this fungicide in, you're going to have to have probably some irrigation to go below, behind it. All right, so speaking of irrigation, we'll, we'll get into that uh, with this last section here on the favorable environment. Um, so with warm season and cool season grasses, um, these are the different uh, varieties that you can have. Notice I call it a one hump tamil, camel for the warm season and then a two humped for the cool season. But notice when we have the warm season, those diseases are occurring in the spring and the fall. And then for the cool season, they are applying, they are happening during the summer. Um, so just know that that temperature component is very important for predisposing the turf grass uh, to these particular diseases. Now, when I think of the number one cause of disease that's, uh, that can be human controlled, particularly if irrigation is concerned, too much water is disease cause number one, whether that, that last picture there, that's actually large patch that's crying into the, into the sidewalk there or into the gutter, I should say. Um, so there's some drainage issues there and then also leaf wetness. So, it turns out, and this probably is not a surprise to most of you, but most homeowners that have irrigation systems simply don't know how to use them and don't know how to program them. Um, so this was a study that was done by Dale Bremer uh, and his colleagues at Kansas State University, basically of a survey of, of several different cities in Kansas. And the striking one here is that 65 to 83% of homeowners responded they don't know how much water they are applying to lawns. Um, so we're making all these recommendations of watering lawns. Most homeowners don't know what that means. They don't know how much an acre inch of water is, 27,000, or they, they just don't know what those numbers are. They haven't used a coffee can and gone out with a ruler and find out what five minutes is. So when it comes to irrigation, consumers need to be better educated. In extreme drought conditions, it's often, sometimes it's best to leave the lawn's dormant um, and realize that Kentucky bluegrass is more drought susceptible than tall fescue. Also, the bottom line is, is that if you're working with a, a homeowner, 
try to grab the irrigation controller from them and teach them what it means. Do an irrigation audit and show them what a tenth of an inch of water is, how much time that is, um, so that it's also it's good water stewardship, but also is going to reduce the amount of d diseases that they have. Also, what time of day? So early in the morning is the time the early bird gets the worm. You can actually knock the dew ingotation fluids off the leaf blades and actually cut off that period of leaf wetness duration. So if you water at dusk, and I see this a lot of times, you water at 7 or 8 p.m., you're basically starting that leaf wetness period um, until it burns off the next day. Whereas if you water in the morning, you're actually knocking all that dew ingotation fluid off whereas the dew might naturally set at 10 p.m. So if you can, time it in the morning and then show them what proper irrigation is. And then last but not least, sometimes it's the soil. So you need to think about this is a new home construction. This is a, probably a $450,000 home and realize that particularly when you're dealing with a new home construction, a lot of times they're scraping off that type of soil and the homeowner is lucky if they're going to get an inch of that back replaced or if they're going to be able to buy any more of that. So how do you irrigate this? That's a very good question. Uh, you would have to pulse it. You would have to do it very slowly. And in some, some cases, it just might not be uh, very, very effective at all to irrigate this. Also realize that what you're looking at with gray and brown is a non-living system. Um, so the turf grass is the thing that's going to be putting all the organic matter in into this system. And you're going to have to increase nutrients. You're going to have to really baby this kind of lawn along until it gets well established. So just a few hints on and notice I say when things go wrong and not if. Um, so here's just a couple of things that you can think of as far as troubleshooting. Um, so developing a list of probable causes. Um, but really, a lot of times, you know, we're here for a reason. Um, so think about using a diagnostic lab, one that's located within your, your own state. Um, there are a number of good ones across the country, North Carolina State, Wisconsin, you know, here in, here in Indiana, Texas A&M has a good lab. Um, try to, to help us as much as possible. Take photos. We all have a camera in our pocket. Uh, we need really only about one to two samples per, per sample, only down to the root zone. We don't need you to go six to eight inches deep. Um, wrap that whole plug in aluminum foil to stabilize it and just don't put it in plastic bags because basically what that does is that gets the party started. Um, and we really we really want to be able to look at this in, in as pure a form as possible. And we'll get the party started when we, we get the sample in um, into the lab to try and uh, boost if there's going to be any pathogens present. Ship overnight for best results. Some like to drive it into the lab. No need to overdo it. This is uh, fairly comical. This was uh, a golf course that sent in uh, four, four samples from nine different greens. So there were 36 samples in there. I think it cost, well, it cost them $135 to ship. Uh, so we don't need that many, just one or two per problem. As much as how to take the sample is where to take it. So for those larger patchy ring symptoms, um, it's critical to go towards the edge and not towards the middle of the patch. So I like to use the third rule, which you've heard for mowing, a third healthy turf and two thirds symptomatic turf. So here, this picture, this is a fairy ring. You would go towards the outside of that ring. And this is spring dead spot. And notice that's two thirds and one third. So. I appreciate your attention. Here's my contact information. Here's the members of, of my team here at Purdue. Um, and those that are help us with the research, we do do research, so I'm not so morbid all the time and not a coroner. Um, so a special thanks to them here. And again, I appreciate your attention and look forward to answering any questions that you have.